Let's talk about how we can use our technology responsibly. Here we're not looking at the mechanics of how we do things, but rather the way that we use them, the responsible use of technology. And our focus here is that we don't want to have an area, an atmosphere of fear, but of respect. Technology is not something to be afraid of, but it is something that we need to have respect for. So let's think about several areas of this. One is what can be called digital footprints. Well, what are we talking about with digital footprints? Let's watch a video by that title. Now, you see what we're talking about with a digital footprint. You leave your tracks behind when you do anything on the Internet. And we've had the NSA spying incident, but apart from that, you have Facebook, Twitter, email, Snapchat, these other things. There are scandals in the news about politicians who've been involved in inappropriate things online, and they've come up 
you leave footprints, you leave tracks behind anytime you do anything on the internet. Let's watch another explanation. This is your digital dossier. Just about all of us have a digital dossier, but many of us have no idea what it even is. Your dossier is the accumulation of all the digital tracks you leave behind. And this accumulation did not just start last week, month, or even year. It started before you were even born. The line between your digital dossier and your identity is constantly shifting. One way to see the implication of this movement is to imagine how information goes into the file of a child born today. Let's call him Andy. The first entry into Andy's file occurs while he's still five months into the womb. It is a sonogram, probably framed by his parents or even forwarded via email to their closest relatives. The same picture will also be copied in Andy's hospital folder and into a file for the pediatrician who will take over after his birth. As the new baby grows, so do the number of items in his digital file. Andy's barcoded bracelet lists facts like gender, time of birth, surname, and more. Friends and family will come to meet the baby, bring gifts, and take more photos, probably with phones or digital cameras. These photos are then also uploaded to other Flickr feeds or Facebook albums as part of the welcoming process. Andy's parents will use their phones to spread the news with SMS text messages, saying something along the lines of, healthy baby boy, born six pounds at 5.30 p.m. Friends will also post to the Flickr feeds, which will conveniently contain multitudes of Andy's pictures. This process of capturing and spreading pictures will continue for Andy's entire life with pictures of the first time Andy sits, stands, walks, and talks. As Andy grows, he will now be able to independently share information about himself. He registers as a user on Neopets, where he fills out his name, age, birth date, and other details. Half of the blanks may not be even necessary to fill out, but Andy does not notice the significance of the asterisks as described at the bottom of the page. And so, Andy grows bigger, taller, and broader, and with him grows his digital dossier. As an adolescent, he is sucked into Facebook, where he posts pictures, videos, and information about his likes and dislikes. Facebook, in turn, deposits cookies into his web browser, tracking his activities. He signs up for a Gmail account and regularly uses Google to research for information needed in school assignments. Google, in turn, keeps tabs on all the searches Andy makes from his IP address. In college, he buys books from Amazon, which asks for his mailing address and credit card number. Andy's credit card company adds even more details to his dossier. The date, time, location, and price of every purchase he makes. And as Andy moves around, the GPS in his cell phone enables his service provider to know where he is and how many times he has been there recently. He is also filmed by surveillance cameras whenever he walks into secured college buildings. When Andy gets married, his dossier expands to encompass all the information about his wife and they start a weblog together to share their thoughts and opinions online. Together they compile shelf upon shelf of digital tracks, files that are recorded and stored under their names. And when Andy has his first baby, aptly named Andy Jr., the cycle is started all over again. These data points, some publicly accessible, others safeguarded to various degrees by companies and agencies that collect and store this data, make Andy's identity as it forms even before he himself begins to shape it. And Andy's digital dossier will even grow after his death. Photos or videos of the funeral, RIP messages on MSN Messenger, or his Facebook status posts. Andy probably never knew how large his dossier was. How aware are you of the tracks you leave behind? Want to learn more about your digital dossier? Now, another video. Think before you post. No, no, no.
Social media can be complicated. Here's some things to think about to help you post smart. Flo Cab, let's go. I might show you where I'm going, but I think before I'm posting, all my pictures have been chosen. I just post whatever. I might show you where I'm going, but I think before I'm posting, all my pictures have been chosen. Not just posting whatever. So many sites to post pics and post comments and make your friends say holy smokes like Robin. Your posts live forever, that's a long time. So don't overshare when you go online, yeah. Your digital footprint will stick with ya. So stop and think before you post that picture or message. Flow cab, let's go. The top 10 things to think about before you post. Number one. Ask yourself what you say it in real life. If the answer's no, don't post it online. And if you wouldn't want it said about you, don't post it about something. Someone else, that's the golden rule. Number two, are your posts vain and narcissistic about your perfect life, all designed to elicit jealousy and envy in the people who read it? If so, don't post that brag, delete it. Number three, that's TMI, folks. I have a rash. Well, I didn't well, want to know. Number four. Are you posting every detail of your life? Who in their right mind is going to find that nice? Woke up, hashtag bagel, hashtag shower, and 20 more posts in the next half hour. Think about the reader when you're sharing. Edit your posting, your friends will keep caring. Number five. A bit like four, here's what else. Keep your relationship details to yourself. You don't need to post every hug and sunset. That might make your single friends feel upset. A moment still has me. If you don't post it, know this. Now let me get back and focus number six. The cryptic cliffhanger, man, like, dude, no one understands. It's a little desperate, begging for attention. Just be a front off the bat with what you mentioned. Number seven, are your posts all complaining? You really need pity just because it's raining. Number eight, curate your photos like a museum. Don't post pics you wouldn't want your grandma seeing. Goes double for anything risky or risque that could affect your future in a big way. And that's doubly, doubly true if it's a photo of a friend and not just you. Number nine. Check your privacy settings. I mean it want creeps of future employers to read it. You really want your Insta face tweets like concrete? I mean all over the streets. Number ten. Post smart okay and spread love. That's the Brooklyn way. I show you where I'm going, but I think before I'm posting, all my pictures have been chosen. So the point is, we need to be careful what we post. You need to think about that. What are you actually going to put online? You want to be careful. Don't put private information online in Facebook, Twitter, other posts. Don't put things like your phone number, your home address, or even actually your city. Don't put your age. Don't put down something like, well, I'm going to be home at 4 o'clock or something, or, you know, my parents are going to be out for the evening, so I'm going to be working on home. You know, don't, don't post things like that online. You may think that it's going just to your friends, but you don't know who might also find that information. So don't post that online. Now, with these, we might just think of the NSA spying stuff, but we need to remember whatever we post follows us. Here is what Hugh Freeze, the head football coach at Ole Miss, says. He's also the coach that you see in the Blind Side movie. He says when, to his team, when you hit send, you're building your resume. That's part of who you are, and it's not going to go away. So think about that. When you post anything, think about, is this going to promote my resume? Here's what you don't want, a video called Two Kinds of Stupid.
Hey, I'm Eduardo. I'm a junior at NHS. I'm not anything special, pretty normal. I get good grades, and my friends are pretty cool. What's up, Eddie? And even my parents aren't too bad. We, we love, love you, you, mijo. I also do a little swimming. Actually, some recruiters have been checking me out. I'm hoping to get a scholarship for college, so my parents don't have to worry too much about tuition. Last week was a championship meet, and it was awesome. Our team owned it. And I set a school record in freestyle. Someone from the team decided to throw a party, and it was crazy. Everyone from school was there, including the hot girl from my science class. Hey, Eddie. <laughs> People were acting so crazy, I had to take them pictures, man. I may have had a little too much fun. It probably wasn't the smartest thing to take pictures, but then, I got really dumb and posted them on my page. It's just what everyone does. And I didn't even think to use my privacy settings. So once I posted them, everyone could see them and anyone could share them. I found that out when I was called to the principal's office and saw some of the pictures from my page sitting on her desk. Coach was there too, and he was really disappointed. It seems like one of my so-called friends had sent them the pictures, but which one? It could have been anybody. My ex-girlfriend, who's always mad at me for something. One of my teammates, who seemed kind of jealous. It could have even been some guy I spoke to once in the ninth grade. I guess it doesn't even matter, because I'm the one who put the pictures up there in the first place. Now my principal's saying that I violated the student-athlete code of conduct. I signed it at the beginning of the year, and it's zero tolerance, meaning no more chances. I'm off the team, goodbye scholarship, on top of that, I got suspended. I've never seen my parents so mad, even my teammates won't talk to me. Some of them were in those pictures, and they've been called into the principal's office too. At first, I was really mad at whoever sent the pictures. What business was it of theirs? But then, I realized that as soon as I posted the pictures online, I made it their business. It was really all me. I was two kinds of stupid. I was the one who broke the rules. And then I posted the pictures online. It was one mistake after another. So that's my story. I used to be this kid. And now I'm this kid. And this was all it took. But then, on the flip side, you're building a resume so you can make that a positive thing as well. Think about this video, positive posting. Like I've seen pictures also where people put up like pictures like where they were kind of revealing a lot. You know, I feel like they're not that explicit in person. But I feel like they put up pictures just to attract certain attention or to attract people that they don't know. People will put up statuses that, to me, are kind of disrespectful sometimes, especially if your parent was actually a part of you on your uh, page, you would not put that up. So I feel like you should be respectful to people who are around you and people who are uh, actually looking at your page. You make sure that if you're going to have something on your page, something that anybody that you care about or anybody that you know would you know be fine with looking at not like including your parents, family members, you know. People put it uh, like a little pictures of them like like their shirt off if it's a guy and like it was it wasn't seen as bad because everybody was doing it. I did like I personally didn't agree with it. I'm like, why do you need to do that? Like, I understand if they put up pictures of they're at the beach or something, but if it's just like a little camera picture in the bathroom of them like with like their shirt off or like showing something, just it's, to me it's just really unprofessional. I heard now that a lot of colleges actually look at like search you on Facebook to actually check out if they want to have you as a student or not. So I, a, lot, a lot of my friends kind of changed their last name or changed their first name in order for them not to be found or make it so you can't be found. With me, I didn't really change it because I really didn't have anything to hide. 
if anything, I feel like it would help me in a way, you know, for the college to look at me and I actually got admitted to um, San Francisco State. Part of it is because it shows that I'm really active with family members because I have a lot of pictures of my family in there. Um, I have older pictures. I put, and also, if, if I'm not sure if they actually can see all the statuses, but a lot of the statuses I put up are connected to some of the work I do because I'm also a community organizer with the organization called Youth Together, so I put up a lot of like statuses about that or I put up my music. and I'm really kind of responsible. I have two sisters that I take care of. I don't have any pictures of me at parties, doing crazy stuff. I don't have any of that. I think colleges will actually like my Facebook page because it kind of shows that I'm active. And I feel like it just kind of like, if you look at my page, it's nothing. I feel like there's nothing on there that kind of brings me down. So what we're talking about here is called digital citizenship, or a biblical way of thinking about it is, how do you use your online tongue? I mean, posting something online is the same as saying it, and the Bible governs our speech. It's going to govern what we say online. What are you saying, either about yourself or about others? This can be through words. It can be through pictures. As you see, the Bible still applies to your online life, particularly its teaching about speech. Don't write or text something that's not honoring to God. Don't write or text something you wouldn't say in person. Or, you might even think about it this way. If, do you want your grandmother to read this? Think about it that way. Now, one problem online is the issue of cyberbullying. Here's something you can watch that deals with that. I heard about a lot of things my friends were doing online that were really mean or just plain crazy. I never thought I would do anything like that. One day, my friend Pat showed me a website he made. He posted a list of girls in our school and had guys we know go on and rate them. Sort of a hot or not kind of website. I thought it was pretty funny, so I rated them too. We had a good laugh and I thought that was the end of it. The next day everyone at school was talking about it. He had sent it out to the whole school to see. I could tell a couple of girls had been crying and I knew it was because of what the guys had said about them and how they looked. I felt bad. But I didn't really get it until I went home that night. Turns out, the guys that put my little sister on the site too, but hid it from me because they knew I would get upset. She was crying when I got home and she wouldn't even look at me. I would never have said those things to someone's face. I didn't even mean them. I thought it was just a joke between friends. Now Pat's suspended from school and they might kick me out too. Once you put something online, you lose control of it. You can never get it back, and people can use it in ways you never even meant. I learned that the hard way. I wish I never saw that stupid sight. In this issue of bullying, it's important to realize that doing things online is different in a way than doing things personally. I mean, if you go up to a classmate in the hallway and you say something mean to them to their face, well, as a Christian, you can go back and apologize to that person, and that's the end of it. You've made up, you've apologized to one another, you've accepted forgiveness, and that's the end of it. When you post something online, it's impossible for you to go to everyone who has seen that, everyone who's been impacted, and apologize and retract what you said. It's out there, and you can't take it back. I've heard the analogy used that it's like trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube. You can't get it back. 
Now another area of digital citizenship deals with pictures. Pictures and websites. And here I'm not thinking so much about what you post but as what you see. As you work online, as you go to different websites, as you do different things online, at some point you're going to come across something offensive, something that's unbiblical, something that's ungodly. What should you do about that? Well, the way to handle that is you should cover the screen so you're not looking at it and so other people don't see it, but don't close that window. Okay, don't just X out of it immediately. Instead, you should go get a teacher. If you're at home, get your parent. Go to them immediately. Show them what you came across. Say, I was doing this, and here's what came up. Show them how you got there. Like, say, well, I went to this website, I clicked on this link, and I clicked on this link, and here's what came up. If you do that, then your parents or we can take steps to block that in the future. But just be upfront about it. And say, here's what I did, here's what came up. And then we can deal with that. Now, another issue in digital citizenship is the whole issue of plagiarism. I mean, it's a, it's a new ball game. When I was in school a long, long time ago, before we had the internet, if I was going to plagiarize, if I was going to copy something from a book and put it in research paper, for example, if I was going to do that, it was hard work because I had to just write it out by hand. I had to copy it out by hand. Now, when you can do copy and paste, it's very easy, and that makes it very tempting. Digital citizenship is saying when you present something as your work, it actually is your work. It's a lie, it's a violation of the Ninth Commandment for you to turn something in and say, here's my work, here's my homework, when it really is something you've copied from somebody else. So, digital citizenship involves avoiding plagiarism. It also involves the idea of what's called fair use or copyright. See, what's common is, let's say that you are making a PowerPoint presentation for something and you want some pictures to illustrate what you're doing. So you go online and you search for a picture and you copy it and you insert it in there. The problem is that picture may be copyrighted and by you using it without permission it is again it's an issue of plagiarism and you violated copyright. Now here's what you can do in order to avoid that problem. This is using what the Creative Commons website. Creative Commons is a website that has uh, set things up so that you can avoid violating copyright. You can find images and find things that are free for you to use. So let's look at an example. All right, I'm at the website search.creativecommons.org search.creativecommons.org and let's say that I'm doing a presentation on airplanes so I go up here in the box and I enter airplanes I leave these two boxes checked I want to be able to use this for commercial purposes which you're not actually doing but you're also wanting to modify it after build on it so I've got airplanes now there are several places that you can go to search for images of airplanes. I'm going to go here just to Google images. Okay. When I go there, this shows me images of airplanes. And these are all, notice this thing here, labeled for reuse with modification. That means they are free for me to use. I don't have to get permission from anybody. I can use them. But look at some of the other tools here. I have across here a lot of different things I can look for. Let's say that my report is on FedEx. I can click on the FedEx button and now I have images of FedEx airplanes. Okay. Or let's say that for some reason you know, I've got a color scheme or something I can find blue airplanes. So here are blue airplanes. 
it's out of that. Maybe I'm looking, I'm doing something on a particular company, or I am looking for the inside of an airplane. I can click here, and now I've got images of the inside of the airplane. And I could even break that down further if I want the cockpit. Okay, so you see what you can do here. There's a lot of things you can do, a lot of searches that you can do. And again, all these images are free for you to use and copy. You don't have to worry about violating copyright at this point. So get in the habit of going to Creative Commons to find images. Now, the last aspect of digital citizenship is just our classroom procedures. And I've mentioned this before, but I want to go through these again. Remember, your teacher is in charge of your use of technology. You are not the one who decides when you get to use it. Your teacher is. If your teacher doesn't want you to use it, you don't do it. That's just the overall rule. We also have our code phrases, screens down. Turn your device over so it's face down on your desk. If it's a laptop, close the lid, or at least close it enough so that you can't see it and access it. Spot check. The teacher says spot check. You immediately turn your device around so that she can see what is online, what you're looking at, what you're doing. This doesn't mean close windows real quickly. It doesn't mean pull up something else so she can see it. It means immediately turn it around. Your devices are to be on top of your desk. Okay, don't have your, uh, uh, your iPad under the desk working on it. Have it on top of the desk. And you should have it, if it's a uh, uh, tablet, it should be flat on the desk if possible so that others aren't seeing it. Okay, if that's, if that's not possible, we realize that, but keep it flat down on the desk if possible. So, these are just some basic principles of digital citizenship. We're going to go over that in more detail during the school year. But if you have questions, please drop me an email or come by my office and see me.